new episode of the Beirut Banyan, and we're joined by Firas Maksad, an adjunct professor at the Elliott School of International Affairs, George Washington University, and a regular contributor to Foreign Policy magazine. And in the details box, you'll see an article he wrote recently, Lebanon's Year of Fire, explaining the economic and the political factors that contributed to where we are today. If you're enjoying this podcast, please consider a contribution through Patreon. The link is in the details box. A view from Washington, the economic failure, the political quagmire, and what's at stake with the uprising in Beirut. I'm Rani Shatah with Firas Maksad, and this is the Beirut Banyan. demonstrations happen in the last few years. We saw the Ustink crisis. We saw protesters on the street. Almost 15 years ago, we saw a revolt that led to the Syrian army's withdrawal with March 14, 2005. This time around, we're seeing something on a larger scale. We've seen the entire country demonstrate on occasion together and even symbolically holding hands in a human chain just several days ago. And just your opinion, your instinctual feeling, does this round, this round of demonstrations and protests and uprising, does it feel different? Ronnie, um, I'm not on the ground in Beirut, and so I, I don't have as much of a feel as uh, anybody who has participated in these protests and been on the streets. But I am an astute follower, and I do talk to people on a regular basis who are there. Uh, with all respect to uh, you know March uh, 20, uh, 2005 and the Ustink movement and the Cedar Revolution, uh, they all deserve the respect as moments of, of genuine people power. But this one does appear to be different. Uh, Lebanon has historically been constrained by the various communal and social uh, cleavages that it suffers from. Uh, th- in this moment in Lebanese history, the people have proven uh, their ability to transcend these cleavages, even for uh, a momentary uh, period of time. We don't know whether coming events will again emphasize those differences amongst the Lebanese. But for now, there seems to be a new generation, a new voice that is determined to overcome uh, those cleavages and come together. Uh, Those cleavages being not only communal, uh, Mm. but socioeconomic, uh, regional. I mean, we're seeing from north to south, east to west, rich to poor, uh, you know, various sectarian affiliations, they are coming out. Uh, That, of course, is not to say that... um, the protesters or the movement will be ultimately able to achieve its stated objective, which you know roughly um, revolve around not only just toppling the prime minister and the cabinet, which has already happened, but really a, a fundamental change in the nature of the Lebanese body politic, and of course the corruption that is involved in that, and so that is yet to be determined, but there is definitely something new that has been brewing and playing out on the streets of of Lebanon. And let me ask you, do you put the onus here on the rapid economic decline in the last few years? Or is this an ongoing political struggle where Lebanese are constantly trying to disengage, perhaps, from the power-sharing structure that we live in? Is is it more economics for the moment, or is is it genuine... Uh, you know, state reform, state, uh, to a sense, not just a revolt, but a revolution against the state. Where do you see the onus? So? Uh, I'm not too sure it has to be an either or. Mm, uh, mm. And it, it, it is almost never a, a single factor or one dynamic that is the causal effect of, of a phenomenon uh, like the one that we're witnessing. Mm-hmm. So I definitely do think that. Um, the socioeconomics of things are a leading driver. Uh, people are being hurt in their pocketbooks. Uh, 
there's nothing to get people to get off, uh, you know, get out of their comfort zone and actually take to the street like hunger, uh, like yeah. a sense of deprivation and indignity that that derives from that. Um, so I, I in, in in my speaking engagements about what's in my commentary about what's happening, I keep saying this is primarily about socioeconomics rather than geopolitics. Um, do you do you th- do you think that's part of the reason why it has not really received that much international coverage? That it seems to be a domestic issue rather than a regional one. I think so, uh, mm. but I don't also think that that is a mistaken view to take, and uh-huh. that there ought to be more coverage. Yeah. What happened in Lebanon often does not stay in Lebanon. It's it's one of those countries that sits, obviously, in a very uh, geopolitically volatile uh, part of the world, and so I don't think that what happens in Lebanon stays in Lebanon, and, and the world ought to be paying closer attention. And what I was about to go on and say is that while this is primarily about socioeconomics, I think that's what's driving people to the streets in an un- unprecedented way. Uh, obviously, Lebanon is Lebanon. Geopolitics is never far behind. Uh, and so we are seeing Hezbollah uh, increasingly in an uncomfortable position, not knowing what to make of the uprising and how to manage the politics that are involved. And that, of course, um, has caught the attention of, of, of various actors in the region and certainly the administration here in Washington, where they view things through the prism of the maximum pressure campaign against Iran, and Hezbollah, of course, being a leading um, proxy of Iran, not only in Lebanon, but throughout the region in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, other places. So there is definitely a geopolitical play uh, to what's happening and still unfolding in Lebanon, but I don't think that the geopolitics of things is what drove the Lebanese to the streets. It is their pocketbooks and the economic pain that they've been that they've been feeling, but also what's coming down the pipeline. Now let's explore Hezbollah's calculations. And you you just mentioned the financial pressure, the the sanctions that have hit uh, at least one Lebanese bank recently. Uh, do you think that their their calculations are taking this into consideration that that they don't want to overstep because they are already in a in a weaker state than they were even let's say a few months ago. You know, you and I are are talking uh, just as news is breaking of Hezbollah for the first time using anti-aircraft missiles. This is the introduction of a new weapon system that Hezbollah, for quite some time, and as late as July, you know, Hassan Nasrallah had said, this is, the, this is the potential strategic surprise, the unknown factor that they've, they've kept out there. Now, I guess it's not a surprise anymore that they do have those weapons and they are deploying them. And there are many, obviously, who see that as, um, as a potential attempt at diverting attention from the domestic pressure that the parties feel and feeling on the streets of Lebanon, and for the first time, anger within the Shia community itself. Um, so th- these are the kind of things that we talk about when we say what happens in Lebanon doesn't necessarily stay in Lebanon. It could right. potentially have new political ramifications. And, and now, mm-hmm. sorry, there go are, ahead. There are, no, there are no easy answers for Hezbollah right now. I mean, they have proven themselves quite adept. Uh, in, um, when it comes to Israel, when it comes to Syria, when it comes to the military dimensions of their activities, they don't have the required experience in governance and in delivering uh, to the people. Uh, and so, you know, if you go with the notion that the 2016 understanding between Hezbollah, uh, Aoun, and Hariri that yielded the, the government that just resigned. Mm-hmm. Um, that this is, you know, Hezbollah's traditional way of governing from behind the scenes, supporting a government that, you know, is supposed to deliver for the people and obviously share in the spoils. Um, that wager seems to be 
running into trouble because those that Hezbollah has empowered in government have clearly failed and therefore put the party in a very difficult position. And any way you slice it, whether Hezbollah does support a new cabinet and holds on to its primary Christian ally of Gibran Basile, the foreign minister, or cuts its losses with Gibran Basile, which seems to be mortally wounded, Hezbollah and its constitu- constituency have to contend with significant financial pain and an economic crisis that is set to deepen. And that is something that is inescapable and they're going to have a really difficult time with. So in a sense, it's more that they are trying at least to preserve some economic stability but keep the political framework intact, meaning that they have indirect support from the Lebanese government or direct support, but they do maybe at this moment want to see some economic restructuring solely to keep this formula in place. That is, that is exactly it. I mean, Hezbollah has had a formula in place uh, at least since 2016, if not before. Um, the understanding that allowed for the election of a pro-Hezbollah or Hezbollah-allied president mm-hmm. in Mishal Aoun and in the formation of a cabinet where Prime Minister Hariri and Wali Jumblad and others agreed to be the junior partners in an otherwise uh, a cabinet that is otherwise dominated by Hezbollah and its allies. And that was a, that was a comfortable political reality for the party. Uh, but clearly one that has failed miserably at governing and delivering for the people. And hence Hezbollah's current conundrum uh, in trying to yet again find a formula, a political formula, that puts it at ease as it relates to its weapons, particularly as there is growing American pressure against Iran and against Hezbollah and sanctions and otherwise. So he wants that kind of a, a, a new formula in Lebanon that could put it at ease uh, at a time when clearly the old formula seems to be coming apart. The old understanding of the cabinet that yielded is coming apart. And this may explain even their deep uh, desire to hold on to Gibran Bessir and for that matter Saad Hadidi, which, which in the end did not happen since he did officially resign uh, as of two days ago. Yeah, I mean, uh, Hezbollah was faced with a a, a tough choice since these protests erupted, and it was either you sacrifice uh, the current government, which they had been backing, uh, and uh, therefore um, sacrifice uh, their partnership with Jibran Basid, Mm -hmm. the foreign minister, because any new cabinet of technocrats that the street is demanding would naturally not have Jibran Basid be part of it. Yeah. Or hold on to Gibran and therefore take on quite a bit of heat uh, in trying to keep this understanding in place, the formula that yielded the that failed government. And they've so far chosen to stick to Gibran Basile, their primary Christian ally, in many ways their political cover mm-hmm. that transcends the Shia community. So they they so far run their political map and they've chosen to stick to Gibran Basile. Let me ask you, and just I know that you're in D.C., and we're going to get to the Washington perspective, the U.S. perspective on what's happening, but the the protesters that, I mean, almost half of the population of Lebanon was on the streets uh, 10 days ago. So you have upwards to 2.5 million Lebanese all throughout the country demanding change. Do, do you think that Prime Minister Hadidi's resignation will satisfy most of these protesters to begin going home and saying, okay, now the, uh, the domino chain is in effect, it's beyond our control, we're going to just go back to our normal tendencies? Or do you think that this kind of momentum is sustainable and, and people will keep pressuring other, other figures, other, uh, perhaps even the president or the speaker of parliament to step down as well? And what is your feeling on, on just the momentum behind genuine change? when it comes to the Lebanese state? Well, I mean, I think this is where my pessimism comes in. And mm-hmm. I've, been, I, I, I've been called the voice of doom on social media recently. Oh, really? The voice? Okay, that's not good. <laughs> that, 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 that is not good, but I, I, I don't mind uh, being the more um, sober voice 
at least to the way that I would put it, mm -hmm. in the face of what has been, and rightfully so, uh, a euphoric environment of, of people, people power, uh, an empowerment of the street that has successfully brought down, uh, brought about at least enough pressure to, to bring down the cabinet. Mm -hmm. um, now, that said, part of my pessimism lies in the fact that there's a world of pain unfortunately that's coming Lebanon's way just in terms of the the expected the financial reality and the expected financial and economic meltdown yes well, the devaluation of the pound the so far inability of the banking sector to reopen and function in a normal manner mm -hmm. the capital controls that are expected and are, are required uh, at this point to try and minimize uh, the extent of the collapse. So from an economic standpoint, uh, there's a world of pain coming Lebanon's way. Mm. And uh, the jovial scenes of people singing and dancing and holding hands, all which are terrific, um, are, going to are, are going to morph into more angry uh, protests where people truly cannot afford to buy the necessities and cannot uh, deal with the reality of what's coming. So I, I am pessimistic and I am concerned in, in how these um, those moments of, of people power and euphoria are going to morph. Now I do hear pushback by people saying, we're, we've been broke anyway. Uh, you know, we wouldn't have been in the streets if, if we're, we haven't been feeling the economic pain, if, right. if our pockets weren't empty. Yeah. Uh, I think there's an underestimation of, of how much pain and how much this economic crisis crisis can yet deepen. Uh, so it's almost like a like a managed bankruptcy is is going to happen with or without. Uh, well, I mean, yeah. people people draw parallels. Is this yeah. going to be a, an economic meltdown and a financial collapse along the lines of Cyprus, uh -huh. of Greece, uh, of Argentina, or Venezuela? You know how. What will this crisis look like as it deepens in the weeks and months ahead? Uh, I don't have the answer to that question. I, I think few people do, but there's no doubt that just the economics and, and, and finance of things are trending in a very negative direction that I don't think people are paying enough attention to. Um, now, in the sort of the mechanics of things, you know, you probably will end up having another cabinet of technocrats of sorts um, headed by Prime Minister Hariri I think that you know Hezbollah and company might choose to go the route of naming somebody aside other from you know Prime Minister Hariri but I do think that that would be an incredibly risky wager for them to attempt mm -hmm. given the expected backlash and you know, some of the communal and sectarian realities of Lebanon that unfortunately are still with us so you know perhaps a cabinet of sorts that is headed by Prime Minister Hariri that attempts to come through on the much-promised restructuring that is required, and maybe even if street pressure is kept up, uh, early elections along the lines of a new elect electoral law, that would be um, the positive or the optimistic scenario where you, you get some kind of meaningful change early elections. So uh, but, Hezbollah, but Hezbollah is clearly pushing back, and Hezbollah did not want to see a change in the cabinet. And now that we do have a change, they probably want to see a more limited one and prefer a political rather than a technocratic government. So the extent of the change um, will depend on street pressure, and there, that's why I am uh, I am not completely optimistic and still think that the, the people on the streets still have a role to play and can bring about a change. But we'll just have to wait and see what the extent of it will be. So in a sense, it's almost like an anticipated reshuffling is maybe the most uh, optimistic view. And reform may happen, but this is not a revolution. Is, is that what I got from your... Uh, I don't want to... I think, I, I've said from, from day one, and again, true to, to being the voice of, of doom, uh, <laughs> that this is not a revolution. Yeah. This is a, a revolt, and I wrote a piece... Uh, Lebanon's year of fire in which I spelled out and said 
what Lebanon can expect, what the protesters can expect, is um, some kind of sectarian upgrading, meaning a, a facelift to a system that is deeply entrenched. And I think the Lebanese need to remember that this, uh, the sectarian quotas and the sectarian reality of Lebanon predates the, um, the state yeah. and independence. Yeah. It is a reality that has been with us since the time of Lebanon as a mutasarrifia. Yeah. Uh, has been with us for, for many, many years uh, that uh, predate the current state. Uh, and so to think that you could do away with this reality overnight is, is, is uh, I think, uh, wishful thinking. So a sectarian up, upgrading where you do have, within the confines of the system, some kind of reform, uh, some kind of better governance, I think is, under current reality, the best that one can wish for. So in a sense, it's more like revisiting Ta'if as opposed to a third or fourth republic. Washington, when, I mean, U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis the current situation, the, the revolt, this, this uprising may not be the revolution that many of us yearn for, but just in terms of both economic, deep, deep economic instability and political unrest, where does Washington, where does Washington stand when it comes to its relationship now with the Lebanese state? Is it, is it an evolving issue that goes beyond sanctions? Is there, is there more than just putting pressure on Iran vis-a-vis -vis the Lebanese financial sector? Or is there maybe a, is there something that is perhaps preferred from D.C., a preferred, pr preferred outcome to what's happening? Well, I think first we've got to put things in perspective. Uh, the Washington that, that I exist in today is preoccupied by a number of competing priorities, mm -hmm. much of which are domestic. Yes, yes. With ongoing impeachment, mm -hmm. uh, but also foreign crises, uh, whether it is trade war with China or what's happening with Iran, uh, Persian Gulf. Uh, so Lebanon does factor in, does register, um, but Lebanon is no longer, uh, and hasn't been for a long time, high on the list of foreign policy priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly does not compare to the years of 2005, say, to 2009, right. when Obama was elected. Now, Lebanon continues to be seen primarily through the maximum pressure campaign against Iran. That is the primary uh, framework through which current administration is, is viewing many of the events in, in the region. But there is also, since the eruption of these unprecedented protests, there is also a recognition uh, that the, U the U.S. ought not to get ahead of the protesters. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. and the administration would do itself uh, some good not to make this about itself, not to involve itself, and, and essentially uh, you know, give credence to Hezbollah's allegation and now Iran, Khamenei's allegations that this is a U.S. driven, uh, Israeli driven conspiracy manipulating the streets and the protesters. Right. So th there is an understanding that this is primarily an event that is being driven by the Lebanese people and ought to stay that way. Uh, 
But as I said, there is an interest naturally in 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 Washington to make Hezbollah uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, the extent of that has been uh, making sure that the Lebanese people who have been protesting, who are calling for the toppling of all of them, with no exceptions, and empowering the Lebanese state and its security forces, that those protesters are protected against the intimidation that we've seen, Mm -hmm. primarily by um, street muscle, not to use the word thugs, that have been supporters of Amal and Hezbollah. So the U.S. has used whatever leverage it has in Lebanon, particularly with the Lebanese army, to communicate that those protesters and people need to be allowed to speak their mind and to do so freely, and that there needs to be reformed as called for by the people of Lebanon and as is necessary to limit the financial crisis and the economic collapse that is coming Lebanon's way. And I think that that's going to be the extent of the American position, uh, with even some unconfirmed reports that uh, sanctions against Hezbollah that had been pre-planned and the administration had been working on for quite some time might be delayed precisely so as not to give the impression that the U.S. is trying to take advantage of the um, situation in Lebanon. Oh, that's interesting. So in other words, in a way, back down from that policy so long as the economic situation is as volatile as it is, sort of take it one step back and wait and see what happens, that kind of sort of delicate approach when it comes to its own its own policies that have more or less defined the Trump administration. That is, that is true. Mm-hmm. They, they are very sensitive to uh, giving Hezbollah and Iran's allegations credence Yes. Uh, to the extent that they are reportedly, and those, those of us who are in D.C. and who communicate with the administration on a regular basis know that they have been burning the flame uh, working on sanctions that are coming down the pipeline targeting not only Hezbollah but also those who are uh, outside of the Shia community that have been empowering Hezbollah whether through um, their political alliance or financially Yes. and eventually even perhaps empowering Hezbollah's allies and not empowering Hezbollah directly. So a lot of that has been in the works for quite some time but now mm-hmm. reportedly there is um, a, 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 the pause button being hit so as not to be seen as trying to take advantage of uh, the people that have come out to demonstrate and pile on and, and be piling on the pressure at this particular moment. And Firas, just to wrap it up, you, you with your keen eye on developments that have been happening, not just the last two weeks, but past years, uh, watching uh, maybe uh, a gradual Hezbollah encroachment on the state, but as you said earlier, not a full control of the Lebanese polity, which clearly they do not want. Do, do you think, do you think, attempts at economic reform or even addressing things like corruption that do not directly relate to Hezbollah's role in Lebanon, do, do you think these things can be remedied so long as something like Hezbollah, meaning a state within the state, a militia outside of the state's control. Can these things be properly addressed with Hezbollah intact, or does this require really a, a deep sort of search into finding a way to diminish Hezbollah's military rule? Well, uh, I mean, let me answer your question in reverse. Uh, there is no... Uh, direct challenge uh, that I foresee in the foreseeable future to Hezbollah's uh, military reality mm-hmm. and dominance uh, as a result of those uh, that military might. Uh, I don't see it. Mm-hmm. Um, what I do see is that Hezbollah is being caught off guard and being challenged and, and including in its community because it's being proven unable to manage the politics of Lebanon and the hard socioeconomic realities mm-hmm. that that entails. But in terms of Hezbollah's weapons, uh, I, uh, it's not been a primary chant uh, amongst the protesters. Right. Uh, everybody understands that there's an undercurrent where many of those in the streets do not appreciate Hezbollah's role in weapons, to say the least. Mm-hmm. 
but this is not primarily about Hezbollah's weapons. Uh, I think that this is the way it ought to stay if, in fact, that these protests want to continue to be cross-sectarian and to be able to bring in support from the Shia community. Uh, you can make Hezbollah uncomfortable, but you can do it walking in through the back door rather than front, through the front door. A direct confrontation with Hezbollah about its, about its weapons at this particular junction, I don't think that would be the right approach. Now, you know, to more directly answer your question of, well, um, is reform possible with Hezbollah? I think in some quarters, yes. Mm-hmm. In other quarters, no. Uh, mm-hmm. Clearly, the nature and size of the organization, the way it functions, uh, its ability to uh, feed off some other corruption and to try and to make up for the sanctions uh, and the financial pain that it's been feeling. Mm-hmm. Uh, clearly, you know, that entails a degree of, of corruption and being able to find ways around rules and regulations and financial reality. So I think there are limitations, but... I also would caution against this notion, well, as long as Hezbollah exists, then we can't do anything to reform or to bring about better governance. I think the Lebanese clearly want to see that in spite of the real- the unfortunate reality of, of Hezbollah and its weapons. Well, Firas Maksad, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Ron. back episodes as events unfold in Beirut. And to stay updated, simply subscribe to your preferred podcast platform or find us on our YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah. This is the Beirut Banyan. Thank you.